and Kelly. And welcome to the Windy Fire Information Community Meeting for Sunday, September 26th. Sorry for the delay, we were having some technical difficulties. Glad everyone has joined us this evening. My name is Nathan Judy, Information Officer for California Interagency Incident Management Team 5. Tonight you're going to hear from members of the Sequoia National Forest, Tulare County, and California Interagency Incident Management Team 5. I want to recognize the Tule River Tribal Council Chairman William Garfield and Bureau of Indian Affairs Monty Karahara. Um, this evening we will be taking uh, uh, questions that you were submitted earlier today over our email and one submitted this evening. This meeting will go for 45 minutes as we have to brief, uh, brief our troops after this meeting at 7 o'clock. Um, the current fire situation on the Windy Fire is 82,278 acres, 2% 2 contained, with 2,303 firefighters on this fire. That includes 63 crews, 142 engines, 32 dozers, and 14 helicopters. This evening, we're going to kick the meeting off with Teresa Benson, the Forest Supervisor for the Sequoia National Forest. Teresa. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this community meeting for the Windy Fire. So for over two weeks, we have been in a firefight, full suppression, to work to contain the Windy Fire. It started during the lightning storms that came through our area on the night of September 9th. It started on the Tule River Indian Reservation. And then uh, a few days after that, it came on to the Sequoia National Forest, the giant Sequoia National Monument. We called a team in on the second day, and we had that team for two weeks, a type two team. And then just a couple of days ago, we transitioned to a type one team, which is the highest level team that you can have on a fire. And the complexity of this fire definitely warrants that. We have team five led up by incident commander Rick Young, who is here with us. And his team has been doing an, a really terrific job. They took the fire over on Friday, and we are setting up the incident command post here in Tulare, and we've got a base camp in Porterville, and we're working, we're working on a second base camp that will be set up as well. Um, I want to encourage you all to view the daily operational briefings that are on the Sequoia National Forest Facebook page. Those briefings are very helpful to you in terms of getting specific information about your community and about areas of interest that you have for this fire. The fire, as, as you're aware, has evacuated many of our mountain communities, and we want to be able to provide daily information to you. And so I would encourage you to check our Facebook page for that information, and hopefully that'll help with a lot of the questions that you have on a daily basis. The priority that we have for this fire is for public safety, as well as ensuring the safety of our firefighters. That's our top priority. Like it was mentioned, we have a lot of firefighters that have been assigned to this fire. We're very very grateful for that and we need to be able to ensure their safety and so that is a very high priority for us as well as the safety of our first responders and our law enforcement that are helping us with this fire. 
So thank you for your patience. And I understand that the evacuations are not easy. It's difficult to not be in your home and we're gonna do everything we can to get to you to your homes when we can. Some of the forest service values that I also wanted to mention to you that we're keeping um, very close watch on and trying to do our best to mitigate effects to are the sequoia groves. We've been getting a lot of questions from the public about what's occurring with the sequoia groves and I want to let you know that we have two different specialists that are assigned that are giant sequoia specialists to the fire as well as resource advisors that are helping us every day with mitigating effects to the sequoia groves. And we also have forest closures that are in place that you can check the Sequoia National Forest website and get the specifics on those closures. But I want to thank you for your help with complying with those closures. Um, we will open areas on the forest when we can and when we know it's going to be safe for you to come back. Um, and lastly, I know you're waiting for the operational briefing, but I just want to thank all of our partners, Cal Fire, Tulare County Fire Department, Tulare County Sheriff's Office, and um, Caltrans and all of the partners that are helping us here locally. We, we're working together as a team and we're going to be working to contain the fire as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Appreciate that. Next up is going to be our operational section chief, Ernie Via, with our operational briefing. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Ernie Villa, I'm the Planning Ops Trainee here with California Incident Management Team 5, so I'll give you a quick uh, overview of what we have here currently. Start off here in the uh, top end and the north end of the fire here. Uh, the fire is still relatively uh, hot along the line. We're continuing to mop up and secure along the uh, Western Divide Highway, as well as out towards the uh, 06 Road out coming out towards the east here. Uh, the fire did slop across the uh, Lloyd Meadow Road here on the east side. We were able to go direct along that uh, piece of fire with dozers and hand line and we were able to mop up and started to secure that area as well. As we come south along the uh, Lloyd Meadow Road here, we have a combination of direct and indirect hand line that go all the way out towards the Mountain 99 corridor near Johnsondale here. Uh, still some heat in that area and uh, it's about to get wind tested in the coming day so we're still doing a lot of work in here to secure that edge. Um, as you come back into Johnsondale here, uh, still got a lot of uh, stuff we're working on in the Johnsondale area here along the west side of the community. And then as you come out uh, just south of that there, as you come out towards Spees Ridge here, uh, the fire remains fairly active in this area. Uh, the fire is still kind of in a backing and flanking motion depending on the, um, the, the exact position on the slope. So over the coming days, we are expecting that the fire will continue to flank and back towards the uh, Kern River here. Um, as you come around the corner here, back into the 16 road, the fire remains fairly active here on the south end of the fire, all the way back in towards Sugarloaf Village. Uh, we were able to try to, uh, we tried to send some engines into the Tobias Lookout here. Uh, we do still have communications and we're, uh, we don't know the exact status of the tower, but we are feeling uh, fairly confident with the information we're receiving that the tower is still uh, standing at this time. We do have a uh, radio communication and cameras attached to the tower, so that's what's given us some level of confidence that the tower is kind of still standing. We will still assess the needs there, or if we can, once we're able to make access, we'll be able to uh, confirm that for sure. As you move back into Sugarloaf Village, uh, we're still kind of in a structured defense posture in here with the amount of fire that's been uh, spotting and uh, burning toward the south there with all the heavy fuel loadings. Um, we're continuing to have a, a very tough firefight here in this area. Coming back in towards the, uh, along the Capanero Road in here, uh, the fire's still burning pretty active. Back in towards the Capanero Road, we are using the Capanero Road as a holding feature. So far from what I've heard uh, that we're gonna, we're feeling fairly confident we might be able to hold that as long as the uh, weather is gonna behave for us. As we move into Pine Flat here, we were able to kind of get fire line out back behind the community here in Hot Springs and we are currently uh, getting fire, allowing it to back into the dozer lines that are above the community here and we're mopping up and securing as it's backing into those holding features. 
As you come out here on the west side of the fire, we still have an indirect lines, both hand and dozer line. They're going to connect out here to the west side. The terrain in this western side of the fire here is uh, it's pretty much impenetrable. We aren't, aren't allowed. We aren't going to be able to get uh, resources out here due to the uh, the terrain, uh, how rough and steep the terrain is. As you move out towards the uh, Tule River boundary here, uh, we do have some more indirect and uh, direct, uh, indirect hand line, both dozer and hand line that's proposed that'll come out here near the Wheaton area. Uh, neck out here in the uh, the uh, northern part of west, northwestern part of the uh, fire, the f uh, f fire crews are currently bringing fire down uh, the two and a quarter road. Uh, they are using aircraft. They had a small window. They were able to use aircraft to support them as they're coming south towards the Wheaton area. And uh, it sounds like that operation will continue through this evening. Uh, the fire is uh, wanting to try to push out to the west and, and try to challenge that line there. So they're trying to continue to stay out in front of it to maintain that as a holding feature. As you come back into the northern part of uh, this area here, we are still holding and mopping up and securing everything that happened uh, the last few days. There are some pockets of unburned fuel that are backing towards the road system, but overall things are looking fairly well. As you work out towards the north end of the fire, the fire is moving back towards the 94 road backing, and uh, we're looking at using the 94 road coming out of Koi Flat as a holding feature. Most of this stuff up in the north, uh, kind of this northern corner here is checked up against the uh, 20, uh, last year's castle fire. It's, uh, it's still burning, uh, but it will eventually run out of fuel to continue burning out towards the north there. Or if it does have fuel that it can find, it's very limited. Uh, everything in this L-shaped uh, pattern right here was an old burn scar, and everything uh, for about the last week and a half or so has been holding within that current footprint. We do plan on sending crews back in there once we can alleviate some of the structured defense threat down here. Uh, we will go back in here at some point and try to check that up. But if it's not moving there, we're feeling pretty confident. We'll let it uh, kind of do its thing so we can address some of the threats that are occurring down here in the south end of the fire. Um, other than that, kind of the end of the report. Thank you, Ernie. Appreciate that. We'll get to some questions for Ernie here in a little bit. Next up, we're going to bring up Jeff Shelton. He's our fire behavior analyst for California Interagency Incident Management Team 5. Good evening. My name is Jeff Shelton. I uh, do fire behavior for the team. And so as the fire behavior uh, analyst, my job is to provide two key things, how fast the fire is going and how intense it's going to be. Uh, with the speed of the fire, uh, what we call rate of spread, it allow us to uh, understand if we have time to uh, accomplish our tactics, if we have time to uh, get folks out of the way, if the fire uh, is moving with purpose. Um, from the intensity side, uh, that gives us a real good feel for the tactics we can do. We use uh, uh, the flame length as our, ga our gauge to determine what kind of things we can do. But if we have flame lengths that are less than four feet, we can generally uh, go direct with hand crews on that. Uh, uh, flame lengths that start creeping up, we have to do different tactics after that. We have to go a uh, line that is indirect from the fire's edge or potentially use um, uh, bulldozers or a, a variety of different tools we have in our toolbox. So what I'm going to talk to you uh, tonight about are three things. I'm going to talk about the weather, uh, I'm going to talk about the fire behavior, and then uh, the smoke, which so is something on everybody's mind uh, for the last several weeks. Um, actually, the last several months, everybody's been suffering under that. So with the weather, we look at trends. There are several things that really are important to us in uh, fire weather. Um, <clears throat> thing that uh, fire behavior is very sensitive to is wind. It provides um, oxygen for the fire, which fire likes, but it also provides a steering mechanism, a way to kind of nudge the fire in the direction that it's going to go. Uh, we haven't had a lot of wind on this fire uh, over for this fire. And the days that we have had wind have been associated with those large growth days where the fire has moved in a, in a certain direction. It's been more of a function with the, the wind of uh, ventilation rather than a wind-driven fire. The other thing that we've been experiencing um, over the life of this fire is low humidity. So the calendar says it's late September, but the fuels 
think it's midsummer the way we've had this hot, dry weather over the last uh, several weeks. It's still the end of peak fire season, but uh, the season typically starts dropping off at this time. But we've been ex experiencing unseasonably dry, unseasonably warm weather for uh, the life of this fire, and we haven't really gotten a break that we need. Looking out into the us um, some values that are, are important to us. See how dry it's going to be during the day, but also what kind of what recovery we're going to get at night. How much moisture is going to come uh, into the fire area at night. And why that's really important is the more moisture that the fuels can uh, marinate in and absorb, the harder it is for that fire to move across the landscape. Because to, to for that fire to project across the landscape, it has to drive out that moisture and then consume it. And that takes energy out of the fire. We haven't enjoyed very good relative humidity recovery uh, over the lifetime of this fire. In the next several days we are going to enjoy some <coughs> excuse me some fairly good um, relative humidity recovery so uh, as we look um, uh, into tomorrow and the next day you're going to see um, a different fire environment out there you're going to see a different um, atmosphere uh, over your communities as we have some wind coming into the area something that we really haven't had um, on this fire over the two weeks. Uh, we're going to have winds that are sustained in the teens with gusts up to 30 miles an hour. It's predominantly going to be over the higher terrain, but what that's going to do is provide a steering mechanism and also a way for spotting to happen. So that's going to be kind of where we're going to transition into um, the fire behavior and what the fire is experiencing from this fire weather. The fire is a fuels driven fire and by fuels driven what that what I mean is the fuels are dictating how the intensities are and where this fire wants to go. If you look at the shape of the fire and where the fire has consumed, it's staying along the highest terrain in the heaviest fuels. And when I say fuels, I'm talking about grass, I'm talking about brush, and I'm talking about timber. What, what I would consider fuels is basically just stored energy. There's an immense about, amount of stored energy in these fuels that are on the ground in this area, specifically over the higher terrain. <clears throat> For those of you who live in the community and those who are familiar with this, you understand that the fuels are very drought stressed over a long period of time, and that's made them vulnerable to uh, bug kill. And that bug kill has really uh, devastated <coughs> excuse me, this area. And you have an immense amount of not just live fuel, but dead fuel intermixed with it. And so as the fire progresses through here, it can move uh, unimpeded through that dead fuel, and it's very uh, resistant to control. As much as we would like to get up and get close to it, it's hard for us to fight fire directly when the flame lengths are immense and the intensity is, be is off the chart. And so that's why uh, you're seeing this footprint expand on a daily basis. As much as we would like to go direct, we've had to adopt an indirect strategy from both an efficiency and a safety standpoint. The fire is going to remain aggressive, especially with wind, over the next several days, even though we're going to have a little bit of uh, uh, relative humidity recovery. But what we are going to experience with this wind is a clearing of the atmosphere. And what you're going to see is the smoke start to clear out and be scoured out, mostly over the higher terrain initially. What that will do is it's going to nudge that, that fire in the direction that the wind is, po is pushing it. We're going to get uh, a west wind and then a combination of southwest and northwest. And so any um, <coughs> entrenched heat along this eastern portion of the fire is going to want to move towards the Kern River drainage. We do have a couple of good things that are in our favor right now. We have the cedar fire scar. I was up there in Sugarloaf looking at that today. And it has a lot of the characteristics in the fuels where the fuels were removed by the cedar fire that we're seeing in the slate fire that caused this little box here to not burn at all. So the same characteristics we're seeing here that are helping the fire to stay put are also we're going to try to count on that and we're going to exploit that in the fire behavior here. 
On this side, where we're expecting some growth, we're into the 2002 McNally scar. It is that that fire was so high severity um, that it converted the fuels from a kind of a loose, widely scattered timber model into a grass and brush model, which is very susceptible to wind-driven fire. So. In the next couple of days, there's a, there's a high probability of this fire moving into the Kern River corridor. It's going to be aggressive, but after that, uh, that two-day period of aggressiveness, we're going to have some higher humidities and we're going to probably be able to go direct on that fire. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with this is the smoke getting scoured out and you're going to have some clearer skies and the other thing that that's going to give us is a, a better opportunity to use aircraft on the fire we get a lot of questions on why we're not using aircraft and so um, looking at that uh, we're going to have a better opportunity to use aircraft as the smoke dissipates out so thank you for your attention and um, if you have questions uh, get them in and if i don't answer them now i can get to them the next time we do a, a briefing great thank you jeff Appreciate that. Next up, we're going to bring up Charlie Norman. He's the uh, Tulare County Fire Chief. Chief. Thanks, Nate. So, 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Um, just it, it's been a tremendous year in the California Fire Service, um, and I was hoping that it would dodge to Larry County at this point and that until September the 9th. Um, we currently have the KMP complex going on. It's about 45,000 acres in Sequoia National Park that we have a tremendous amount of resources on, and um, the Windy Fire has also taxed our resources extensively. Um, we do have the EOC open, our emergency operations center open, if there's any ancillary services that we need to perform, and we will be here for the entire incident, and once the incident is over, uh, the, the county will still be here to assist in any way possible. Uh, first and foremost, um, our, our mission is life, property, environment. We want to make sure everybody's safe, and I want to thank you for adhering to all the evacuation orders and the evacuation warnings, so that minimizes our probabilities of anybody getting hurt, anybody getting seriously injured and it makes our job easier as firefighters to take care of business um, uh, our incident has reported some structure loss in the Sugarloaf area once we get those confirmed we will um, meet uh, we have a county process and we will help you evaluate your structure and get back in when it is safe to do so one thing that uh, we really need once you adhere to the evacuation orders and evacuation warnings, uh, misinformation. Make sure when you're getting information, you're getting it from a credible source. Uh, Tulare County Fire Department, uh, Sequoia, um, Tulare County Sheriff's Office, the incident management team. Make sure you're getting the information from a credible source. I know Facebook is a tremendous tool for communication, but there's also a lot of misinformation on that. Um, our primary goal and what we've done with the structure defense, I can't say enough on how Tulare County and all the local agencies as well as uh, Forest Service and Cal Fire have done uh, preventing the community spread. They've done tremendous work in our communities in Johnsondale, Fairview, Ponderosa, Whitsett, and we continue to do good work all around this fire. Um, it couldn't be done. In addition to the big agencies, you know, the, the Wood Lakes, the Tulare, the Visalia, the Dinuba, the Porterville, everybody chips in on this. This is just not one agency ordeal. This is many, many agencies and many, many agencies outside of the fire service. Um, in addition, just to uh, talk about our evacuation orders, uh, my colleague in public safety, Sheriff Mike Boudreau, has been with us step, step, and step every step of the way. Um, he grew up in the California Hot Springs area. His father was a resident deputy up there. Um, he's driven the fire scene. He knows what's going on. So he's also, in addition to the fire department, the sheriff is 100% on board and supporting everything we do. Um, with that, uh, the road closures in effect. If I can just briefly cover this on behalf of the Sheriff's Department. We have Highway 190 at Rio Vista in Springville. We have Fountain Springs, Mountain Road 56 to, and Mountain 109. Jack Ranch Road and Old Stage Road and Mountain 99 at the Camp Ledge Campground. So just remember the officers out there are just trying to keep you safe. Um, that is all I have at this time. Um, I'll be here to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for helping us keep you safe. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. Next, we're going to bring up Courtney Salam. She's with the Tulare County Health and Human Services Office. Courtney. Did I send my last email? 
Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, good evening everyone. Courtney Salam, um, Human Services Representative for Care and Shelter on the KMP, um, Complex Fire and the Windy Fire. A couple of things I wanna bring to you tonight. Um, we have our temporary evacuation points um, still intact. So we have um, one and Woodlake Community Center located at 145 North Magnolia. Porterville College, located at 100 East College in Porterville. Um, currently, our TEPs are open seven days a week, and they are open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., staffed with our Health and Human Services staff alongside our American Red Cross partners. Um, we are also partnering alongside United Way and Tulare County CSET in meeting the needs of the community, both um, Porterville College and the Woodlake um, Center. Okay, moving on to our shelters. As to our shelters, this year um, it looks a little different from last year when it comes to sheltering. Last year, FEMA allowed for reimbursement for providing hotel rooms during the incident, and I know we've gotten a lot of questions about that. Um, Non-congregate sheltering was also approved um, as a form of shelter according to FEMA regulations, which allowed for us to, as a county, to be reimbursed um, for our cost. This year, um, our sheltering has reverted back to congregate shelter. Um, this form of sheltering follows both the American Red Cross guidance and regulations um, set forth for FEMA. For those with RVs who are also looking for RV parking um, or information, those locations are located at um, our Tulare Ag Center, our Woodlake Community Center, our Porterville College Congregate Center Shelter as well. Um, and then for those wishing to pay for their own RVs, um, you can contact 211 and they have some additional options um, for you to um, get information on. Hotels at this time are only being offered um, to community members who are positive for COVID. Um, those looking to shelter um, at any of the congregate shelters will be giving a rapid COVID test, um, and this is being provided in order to mitigate any spread of the virus. So before entering into the shelter, if you show up, you're gonna probably be asked to provide a COVID test. Um, in addition, as we move through these fire incidents, there are many questions regarding next steps and damages. Um, Tulare County Health and Human Services would like to provide ongoing support by way of providing a live person to take on your calls and provide resources as we move through the coming days. We understand the uncertainty and the frustration and the concerns for those who have been directly affected um, for these two incidents and recognize that many have questions and concerns that would like um, to voice. Um, for those purposes, we wanna make sure that we can provide that support. At this time, if you're looking for direct contact um, information, please, you can call 559-802-9790. I'm gonna repeat that again. 559-802-9790, at which time you'll be prompted to select which fire incident you're calling and seeking further information about. Um, this, you will be also be connected to a live person, and um, the purpose of this is just to help answer some of the questions that are coming forth. Please know that your livelihood um, is our utmost concern and priority, although um, we may not have specific information in regards to your specific areas of concern, we are dedicated to getting through this process alongside you. Our goal is to ensure that up-to-date information is available through our call center, but it may take time for us um, to get that information for those who are fighting the fire and working to protect your properties. We ask for your patience and your cooperation when working through this time. What you can expect when you call, you'll get a live person. They will probably request your contact information, additional information pertaining to your area of concern, and then additional guidance um, as far as resources or any additional information that you'd like to share. The hours of our call center for right now currently are going to be Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. This will begin tomorrow and weekends coverage will be 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Lastly, on donations, there's been questions about donations and support. So I wanted to give you an update on that. We currently continue to partner with United Way, who have been amazing in partnering with 
um, the support of the fire and now with donations as well. United Way um, has two drop-off and pick-up locations for donations, one being um, Parenting Network located in Porterville. That address is 770 North Main Street, Porterville. The second location is Salvation Army located in Visalia. One of the addresses are 339 Northwest 3rd Avenue in Visalia. You can also access United Way um, for further information via their website at UnitedWayTC. Dot org. I'm going to say that again, unitedwaytc.org. If you're watching and wish to provide donations monetarily, you can donate through United Way by texting FIRETC to 4144. You can text FIRETC to 4144. You can also access United Way's um, website um, for more additional information. Lastly, um, we continue, although for our call center, we have um, provided you with a direct line, you can also reach 211 and they will also help provide you information and get you to our direct line if you don't have the contact number on hand or if you simply want to contact 211. We continue to partner with United Way um, to help us through this process. Um, in conclusion, I just want to thank everyone who's continues to partner alongside Human Services, Health and Human Services, um, our fire department, all, everyone who's been to the table and supporting this effort. We thank you for your support and hope you have a good night. Great. Thank you, Courtney. Appreciate that. Next up, we're going to bring our incident commander for Team 5, Rick Young. Thanks, Nate. So we assumed command of the Windy Fire at 0600 on Friday morning with the stated intent of implementing a very aggressive full suppression strategy. Our priorities are, as, as Chief Norman alluded to, the preservation of life and property and the protection of the, the natural features that make this area so special and unique. Um, as fire behavior talked about, we've uh, experienced some uh, very challenging days here with, with fire weather and fuels, and that's led to some, some large fire growth. Uh, I'm confident over the coming days we're going to start seeing some containment on that line. You're going to see that containment number start to come up a bit. I want to thank all the cooperators that have been just uh, really great to work with, but a special thanks to uh, the Tulare County uh, Fire Department and the Tulare County Sheriff's Office. Their, their coordination, their assistance, and their communications has simply been outstanding. I'd also like to thank the, the Tulare uh, unit of CAL FIRE for their operational support. As Chief Norman said, uh, we, Getting timely and accurate information is a priority, and it's a priority for this team. So please make sure you're following the right sources, follow the, the, the Facebook page here, and we will provide you with the most timely and accurate information we can from the, from the incident. In conclusion, I'd like to recognize the, the firefighters, the brave men and women that are out there currently, some very rugged terrain, um, some brutal conditions, helping us meet our goals here. And I know everybody's got a lot of things to do, so I want to thank you for joining us tonight and uh, your continued support. Be well. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. So that concludes the formal briefing portion of this fire um, informational community meeting. Next, we're going to answer some of the questions that were submitted earlier online, and if we get some chance, the ones that were submitted. Uh, first up, we have a Teresa Benson with the forest who's gotten some questions. Teresa. All right, I've got a few questions that I will attempt to give you some information on tonight, but I also want to encourage the folks that had these questions to please follow up with the Forest Service so that we can provide more details and also get some of your input and involvement with some of the questions that you have. And so one of the questions that we have for the Forest Service is, can you assure residents bordering the monument that the United States Forest Service will make fire breaks? The giant Sequoia National Monument is approximately 320,000 acres. Um, the forest itself is about a million acres, and so the monument is about a third of that area. And I'll just walk over here and show you. The giant Sequoia National Monument is the area that it goes up a little bit further, borders the reservation here, and then comes along here. So a very large part of the monument has burned in the Windy Fire, and then the Castle Fire also burned a very large part of the monument. 
The monument was established to protect the giant sequoia groves that are within the monument. There's about 33 groves that we manage. But we also have a lot of different mountain communities that live within the boundaries of the monument and on the border of the monument. And so a lot of those communities like Camp Nelson and Ponderosa have been impacted by both the Castle Fire and now the Windy Fire. And so I can definitely tell you that it is very important for us to work with the communities within the monument to work on plans that will help to protect those communities. We want to work with those communities and also partner with Tulare County and other folks that have interest in, in providing that kind of, of protection. Um, there are a lot of different environmental um, documentation needs that we have because it is a giant Sequoia National Monument. But we have learned how we can do that successfully and we're committed to working towards that in the future and that's what we need to do. Um, I won't go into a lot more detail but I just want to tell the person who has asked this question that we should definitely make some time to connect and talk if you're a member of one of these communities and look at what we can together plan. We have some of our communities in the forest that have formed fire safe councils. Um, for example, up in the area where the KMP complex is threatening, there's a council called the Oak to Timberline Fire Safe Council. And it's a group of private community members that have formed a group to work together to provide defensible space around their community. And we work, the Forest Service works directly with the Fire Safe Council, and we work with them to get grants and opportunities to bring funds in to help that community. And I think we should be talking with you all and looking at opportunities that we can do similar work together. Um, I think a lot of the, the other two questions are kind of similar, but I'm going to address them just to recognize the folks that asked these questions. What can we do to get our forests clean of excess fuel? I will tell you that the Sequoia National Forest number one priority in the three years that I've been the forest supervisor has been fuel reduction. That is our number one priority on the forest. The forest is growing faster and providing new fuels every year faster than we we can remove them. But it is our goal and our objective on this forest to remove fuels. That's what we have to do. And we're going to continue striving to do more and more of that every year. We have a lot of plans in place for this next year to remove fuels. We've been able to successfully get some large grants from the state and as well as federal grants that we've applied for a lot of additional money. In fact, we've increased our fuel reduction on the forest by um, many acres in the last three years and we're going to continue to increase that. We've, we need to be removing at, at least 30,000 acres of fuel every year from this forest and we've been averaging about 10,000 on a good year. So we need to do a lot more and we appreciate any help and support that you have that you want to express towards that goal. And so connect with us and reach out to us and we want to get you on our mailing list for those projects. We have many projects that we've proposed across the forest this year that do exactly that. Number one priority on the forest. Last question, are these fires the cause of mismanagement? I have lived here since 1984 and have never seen fires like this. I've worked on the Sequoia. I started working here in 1990 myself, um, and I have spent the majority of my career on this forest and have seen my first fire was the Stormy Fire in 1990. It was 25,000 acres. And we've had the Manter Fire in 2000, 150,000 acres, and the McNally Fire in 2002 was 155,000 acres. So we have had very large fires, a lot more since then. I won't spend all night telling you about every fire but this forest has a lot of fire scars on the landscape. But I will tell you that 
the last couple of years, the Castle Fire and the Windy Fire have been in an extremely dry mortality belt. That the drought that has been occurring for the last 20 years have developed a very large amount of fuel where this fire is burning. And that's what you're seeing, and that's what um, we had our fire behavior analyst, Jeff, was up here earlier, did an amazing job explaining that to all of you. But I will tell you that we need to do more in terms of the management, and we need to remove fuels, whether it be from mastication, from biomass, from chipping, from any kind of prescribed burning, um, burning of piles. One thing I'll just say that um, we're hopeful for is that the Long Meadow Sequoia Grove, where the Trail of 100 Giants is located, I personally visited that area on Friday. Um, we have done a lot of management in that grove for the last 10 years. There was a lot of mortality of the trees that are not sequoias in that grove. And there were hundreds and hundreds of snags that we felled, we piled, and burned. Last year, um, between the Castle Fire and um, probably May, so about a five month period, we burned over, there were probably 2,000 piles that we burned. Thankfully, we were able to burn those piles. And when I went to the Trail of 100 Giants a couple days ago, we saw very limited effects, very low intensity fire that came through there. We did not lose any of the giant sequoias. And it is because we were in there removing fuels. And so that is what we need to do for our giant sequoia groves. Um, with that, I, I could probably talk about this a lot longer, but I want to just let you know that we're available. The Forest Service is committed to fuels reduction on the forest, but we need the help of our partners and you. And so thank you for your support on this topic. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Teresa. So we just have a few more minutes here. We're going to bring Ernie up to address some of the uh, operational questions that you had, and then we have to prepare to brief our troops here at 7 o'clock. So we only got a few minutes here. Ernie? Okay. So uh, real quick, the first question I have here is why are aircraft not being used uh, on on the fire and I think Jeff kind of touched on it there uh, even though the air may be clear up here on the top or top end of the ridge lines down here where the helicopters are positioned the uh, smoke's been settling down on the valleys there so we do try to use them any effort any chance we get we'll definitely push them out there uh, if struck uh, if the fire grows how safe is Pier Point and Camp Nelson, could it cross 190? It can, it can cross 190 with the southwest wind that we're projecting for tomorrow here, as you've seen on the charts. This firing operation right here has potential for these upper end right here. Uh, we do have some potential that the fire could push out in that direction. So uh, up here high, it's still hung up in the burn scar from the castle fire. Uh, there are some stringers of fuel that could reach down into the community there. So we're still keeping our eye on that. And we have a plan in place should that occur. Uh, why is CAL FIRE absent from private lands within the Forest Service? Uh, they aren't. They are actively engaged down here in the Sugarloaf area. Uh, we are working together and uh, with Tulare County Fire. We have, uh, I think uh, Chief put it best, we're working collaboratively in this area to protect all the valleys at risk with life and property being number one. Uh, next question, uh, if the threat is minimal to Camp Nelson, can you change the evacuation order? Um, I know I spoke to that uh, the other day in the briefing. Uh, I meant minimal, meaning that we do have natural features like the burn scars we have here. It doesn't mean that the threat's not there. I think there's potential with the wind that we're getting, the dry fuels, there's a, there's a chance that it could happen and we have to be prepared in case it does occur. And yes, we could change the order and we will do so as soon as we can. We understand uh, what it is, uh, what you're going through. Uh, air resources, why is air support not being used? I think I touched on that one. Uh, what is the status of the pack saddle grove? Did the fire crews prep ahead of the in time? Um, during the transition, when the team first came on uh, station here, the fire had made a big push across Mountain 50, and by time we actually took command of the fire, uh, we received phone calls about 5:30 that morning that they were going to be pushing uh, ma a mandatory evacuation for California Hot Springs. At that point, our priority became life property uh, threat mitigation down here in this community. Um, it, we did try to attempt to use the uh, one of these roads that came out here, I believe the 64 road coming across the below the pack saddle. At that point, we started receiving spot fires multiple down here in Tyler Creek. So 
it was tried, but by the time we got uh, folks in there, it was too late. Status of the Deer Creek Grove, uh, fire has hit uh, the Deer Creek Grove there. Uh, don't have an exact assessment, but it did flank and uh, push through that area. Uh, we will have a group of people that will be assessing that with the giant sequoia uh, specialists that are in here now. We have a plan to put a group together that will uh, go back and assess the damage with them. Uh, the status of the Black Mountain Grove uh, fires only touched a small portion of that grove, probably right here in the uh, west uh, or east corner right here up uh, near the boundary there. So far, uh, the fires pretty much stayed out of it. It does have potential to cross into it, but uh, as of now, we nothing. What is the status of the Spear Creek cabins? Uh, I don't have any information on that. We can gather that, and I think that uh, Tulare County Fire spoke to that. They do have, we have folks that will be coming in doing a full assessment of what all the damage looked like from the fire. We'll get that out to you so that it is uh, accurate. Uh, what is the condition of the uh, the Boney Wit area south of uh, Pine Flats? Um, I, I can't, I don't have the information currently, but we will get that information back out to you as soon as we have it. Uh, at the previous meeting, you have repeatedly said you would uh, let the fire burn down to the 94 road and stop it. It looks like it, it has jumped over the road moving towards Koi Flat Campground and Camp Nelson. So I know sometimes the view on these maps are kind of deceiving, but uh, it is actually backing into that road in some areas. And we do have fire resources on a 24 hour staffing. So we do have people out there at night. They're watching it continually and they'll definitely uh, sound the alarm early if it does make any kind of push down into the community. So uh, other than that, that was the last question. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie, appreciate that. So folks, that's what we, uh, the time we have for this evening. Appreciate everyone joining us. Thank you. Uh, we will let you know when we're gonna have another virtual public meeting. Should be coming up here per pretty soon. And we'll make sure if we didn't get any of your questions addressed, we will reach out to you via email and or if you were on Facebook or Zoom, make sure we get those questions answered for you. Thank you again. Uh, we gotta get ready to brief our troops. Have a great evening.